Um, my name is Adam Gordon. I am the director of educational outreach at a startup in Minneapolis called Andamio Games. Andamio is Spanish for scaffold. And we uh, kind of hang our hat on uh, scaffolded uh, games to engage kids in STEM subjects. And what we're really looking at is finding those subjects that are required, necessary to teach, uh, but are hard to learn and hard to teach. Uh, what are the mostly invisible processes sure. uh, that are, or abstract processes that teachers maybe um, have a hard time engaging their kids with, maybe lose their kids, but they're the kind of required things that, you know, we can't go on until the kid really understands how cell respiration works or whatever. And, and uh, so that's what we're trying to do, engage kids by using games to teach difficult STEM subjects. So, And so why games? Well, you know, f for us, uh, we are, uh, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's what students are more and more used to now, this, uh, this way of interacting in the world through games. And we like in particular about games, uh, taking, taking it out of the pass fail mode and moving into a world where uh, repeated attempts and failures are actually part of the deal. That uh, working, uh, working until you uh, win or uh, get the answer or solve the problem is the mode of learning rather than uh, if I try this, I'm going to fail and so I'm going to give up. So uh, it's really trying to change that paradigm. And I guess the, the other piece of it for us is um, we've got a very strong collaborative piece. And we feel like uh, putting uh, students in a collaborative mode makes that peer learning uh, possible. And when they are in a collaborative mode in a game, uh, it takes away some of the uh, unnecessary competition that can kind of squelch certain students. Uh, and what we found is uh, students who are kind of reticent or quiet actually come to life when they're put in this new kind of problem solving mode, as opposed to uh, achieve and score mode. Yeah, I mean, achieve and pass or, you know, pass or fail mode. So, um, so that's, that's why games for us. Great. So I saw iNeuron. Is that, do you have more games than that or just more that are coming? Yep. Um, so uh, in addition to iNeuron and, and we're actually uh, well into, right now we're doing classroom testing on iNeuron version two, which is about five times the content as what's on the app store right now uh, and kind of completely redesigned. Um, we just won an NSF grant in uh, November and just started it um, to uh, build a game to teach uh, cell respiration. And uh, so we're going at it from uh, the perspective of photosynthesis, both at the cell level, but also then bringing that over to global systems, connecting to that, what's going on in the world. And uh, we also will be releasing probably this quarter a game to teach the basics of electrical engineering. And we partnered with a local museum called the Bakken Museum uh, to create a curriculum that will scaffold uh, students up on uh, the basics of electrical engineering. So. Wow. Well, if you need any beta testers, let us know. I'm sure we have some teachers that would love to help you guys out and uh, get your stuff in the classroom. Well, we do need beta testers, and we, we think we've figured out an interesting way to get it in the hands of teachers outside of classrooms, but that's the first step. You know, we just find that that's an easier first step to just, because they're going to be maybe not the end user, but they have to implement it. And so we try to include teachers very early on in the process before we actually say, hey, let's put this in a classroom, we try to get feedback and uh, development help and ideas from them early. And then we say, all right, now will you try this with your, with your kids? Because we know how precious that time is and it's just hard to, 
So, but I'm going to take you up on that. I, right. Scott, I really am. We, You've kind of skimmed on this a little bit, but what does that kind of process for you guys look like as far as kind of gamifying uh, a subject area or a topic or a classroom? Uh, and I know that's probably a pretty broad question, but yep. maybe give us some background on that. So what the process looks like for us is first – uh, we look at the difficult problem and we, we actually go at it from what are the uh, typical misconceptions that get perpetrated around a, an idea. And we, we look at, well, what is the moment that creates that misconception and can, can we get in there and uh, address that through uh, scaffolding in a game? So we start to build a big outline, a big framework for lesson planning. Okay, what do we want to teach generally? Uh, and then within that, what are the key points? So once we have kind of an outline, then we look at that lesson plan and we say, what parts of this lesson uh, lend themselves to the kind of interactions that can happen in a collaborative game using mobile devices. So it's not everything. So part of our game is just scaffolding right. that's in a tablet form. It's, uh, you know, we're not trying to replicate a textbook per se, but there is some information that just has to get in. So if I'm gonna play the neuroscience game, I have to understand uh, how electricity passes through a neuron and that it turns into a chemical at the, at the uh, at the synapse and those kind of things. So some of that has to be just disseminated, you know, through a good scaffolding. But then there are parts that uh, actually uh, can uh, yield to a game approach. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those moments. When can we, uh, having scaffolded and provided enough information, when can we now uh, create a game uh, that especially one that's collaborative uh, and uh, constructivist, which is to say, put kids in a position to create and build uh, uh, what they're doing, and they'll remember that much better than if they're just reading in a book or taking notes or seeing it in a movie. But actually, have them build the neural pathway; they'll remember that forever. So that we're looking for those moments and for different ways, uh, different interactions that are kinesthetic, um, um, somehow analogous uh, from a modeling standpoint, not just random, but can I, can I have them you know, use the iPad in a certain motion that matches the Krebs cycle, for example, or what's going on there? So we try to model different uh, activities based on what's going on, make them kinesthetic, collaborative. And so that's what our process is. And it's kind of starting at a high level, uh, looking at what parts of that subject could actually, uh, could we move the, the learning and interest forward using the game. So. So you guys are doing some pretty advanced stuff as far as gamification goes. And obviously our teachers aren't gonna go out and recreate their own app or, or build it, an advanced gamification platform like you guys are doing, but is there a way that you may be able to um, strip that concept down that our teachers may be able to kind of gamify just a subject in their classroom without necessarily building an app, but really just taking some of the basic ideas and principles of gamification and, and maybe um, is that going to be as effective, not as effective, but more effective than maybe the traditional classroom setup? So, um, you know, we are uh, both uh, driven by and hampered by a device. Like we think that a mobile device, and right now that's a tablet, it might be a more hybrid device, uh, is the way that this interaction can happen. But we certainly uh, are looking at ways that teachers just gamify their classroom in, in basic ways, put their, uh, put their kids into a position to play games. Um, I don't know if this is responsive, but one of the things we did when we, so our first game, iNeuron, was, is funded by two NIH grants. And in the first, uh, <laughs> 
our lead scientist says, well, I'm kind, I'm kind of a lazy guy and I don't like doing things over and over again. So what I'm gonna do is build a, an engine that will take a common input uh, of curriculum and then output a game. So he created this engine, which we call Forge, to, to uh, take PowerPoint or uh, Google Slides and uh, so that anyone, a person who does not have a, uh, uh, either a game design background or a programming background, can take a curriculum and think of that curriculum in terms of what happens first, what happens second, what happens third, and what do I have to do from a scoring or game standpoint to move to that next part of the curriculum. So for so we think that's a fairly basic gamification that I don't get to move on to types of neurons until I have an understanding of how an individual uh, how the communication or electricity runs through an individual neuron, uh, and then I don't move from types of neurons to how they connect until you know I understand something more. So in that sense, any scaffolded curricul curriculum could be gamified and. Our finding is that when kids are put this way, they keep getting motivated to get to that next to that next level. Um, so that's I I think I think the the last thing I'll say is the problem is how many teachers have the time and willingness to do this, and what we've found is it's a small number, and I'm not gonna I mean because they got too much to do already. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything bad about teachers. In fact, every classroom I've been to, I, just my jaw drops, all that they do, you know. Literally, I just cannot imagine what they do on a daily basis and, having to, and be, being faced with that. So now I'm saying, oh, and by the way, can you also gamify your curriculum? You know, it seems like, okay, we're asking too much, but the best ones have, all, have been doing this already. You know, they just, so, um, yeah. Great. Yeah. So one thing I was thinking, of, I like what you said earlier about how you like to have the game be kind of collaborative and how there's like teams. So it's just not as super competitive, right, as that some kids thrive on, like actually both Scott and I would thrive on the super competitiveness, whereas some people would kind of just shrink and not want to do anything because they don't want to make a mistake or they don't want to do that. So. I'm feeling like that's something that had to have grown just when you guys designed the product um, that you like, oh yeah, like that's something that we don't want teachers to like, we don't want teachers just to make it all about competition because sure, some people love it, but some people definitely dislike it. I guess I don't know what my question is, except that it sounds like you guys have considered the challenges um, of gaming a topic or a classroom. Are there any others that you would definitely watch out for? You know, uh, competition is going to occur whether or not we uh, explicitly lay it into the game. So what happens is with ours, the, you know, you have pairs or threesomes of kids working on a, a challenge, and then there's another pair over here and another group over here, and they know that they're all working on this challenge. And so there's this little buzz in the classroom, and when someone gets it, the other teams kind of know, you know what I mean? So there's this competition that arises, but it's not built into uh, the game. It's not like, oh, your team won because you came first. It just, it arises naturally. Um, you know, what, what motivates someone to keep moving through information when it's not World of Warcraft or when it's not Candy Crush or you know what I mean? So uh, we're actually, we're actually uh, trying to get kids to move through material that is uh, complicated. They, they might say dry, they might, you know, how do, we, how, how do we motivate them through? So there's that individual piece and part of that is just points uh, and I'll pull the curtain back on our point system later on. Uh, but, you know, part of it is points, but part of it is also uh, they, get, they get immersed in the game because of the collaboration, not because of this, this wicked uh, 
music and 3D graphics and all this, but because they are put into collaboration with someone. That's what gets them immersed. And they forget for a second that they're learning a difficult science, you know, uh, a difficult science thing. So we're trying to get at that game state in a different way that has this, this other impact as opposed to the game state that we would have in a, like a shooter game or something else where we, where everything goes away. So we actually want a different kind of game state and that's, that's what we're going for. So you kind of skimmed on this a little bit as well, Adam, but what are some of the biggest challenges that you guys see as far as gamification or maybe game development around education? Um, are you talking about, uh, in practice or <laughs> like the, the hardest thing is, is commercialization. I mean, yeah. I mean, we've got this team of PhD scientists, uh, amazing, uh, learning designers making all this stuff. But the question is, uh, how do you, you know, the hardest thing is your end user is a student the person who decides whether or not it gets used is the teacher and uh, the, the, how it gets paid for is a total mystery. Is it, is it a district level? Is it a, a purchasing person? And then there's IT departments who are also kind of gatekeepers. So like navigating that as a startup company is, that's the hardest thing is figuring out how to do that. Now from a, a pure game standpoint, the feedback we get from uh, kids is, can more of it be a game? So they, there is pushback against um, regular, just curriculum. And anything that starts to feel like curriculum or is leaning towards a textbook, they're like, can you make this a game too? You know, so one of the things that, uh, one little module that we haven't really built out in iNeuron, but it's there because the teachers want it, is uh, different parts of the brain. And we've been collaborating with a, a AP psych teacher who, you know, as many times as I've looked at these different parts of the brain, the hippocampus, the amygdala, all this stuff, I forget it in about five minutes every time. I don't know about you, but like, okay, what does what? And what does the frontal lobe do? And well, so does everyone learning this. So we have to gamify that so that, you know, hippocampus uh, is the hippo went to campus. That's where learning happened. Or, you know, we have to do things to like gamify every single moment. And that's what the kids start to want. They don't want to read through. They don't want to take an ABC test anymore. They want it to all be a game, all be, you know, so that's our challenge, finding that balance. Um, we don't want it to be uh, chocolate-covered broccoli. We, we, want it to, we want it to be fun, but it really it has, to, it has to work as well. So that's our, that's our challenge. What are maybe some resources you might be able to share for uh, our teachers that we're working with um, that if they want to gamify their classroom or maybe start gamifying lessons, um, what are maybe some resources out there? What are first steps that you could give them to maybe start that process? Um, well, if they're, well, even if they're not in the Midwest. So um, there are people very passionate about this. And I went for my first time this last summer to a conference called GLS. So it's Games and Learning and Society. And it takes place in Madison in the summer. Last year it was July, this year it's August. It's, it's largely academic and it's, it looks precisely at this. How did people bring games to the classroom? Um, how do, one guy was there saying, here's how I gamified an entire school. How we gamified interacting with kids like, uh, we put them all on this achievement level, and if they're on, on the, the first part of this level, then we treat them a certain way, and every teacher knew where every kid was. And so now it's this hyper-personalized learning experience where every teacher, the gym teacher and the math teacher and the English teacher, they all know where every kid is. So the example is a kid comes to school who has been missing from school. Instead of shaming that kid and saying, you're, here's all the work you're missing, every teacher knows uh, they go to that kid and they say, we're so glad you're here today. What do you need? Can I get you a piece of paper? Can I get, you know, until 
that kid has been coming to school for a while, and then they put them on a different scale. It was like, all right, now you got to step up. But it, they don't just hit that kid who's just having trouble getting to school. So he gamified that whole relationship. And, and so this conference is amazing. And I know there are other uh, games and learning conferences. That's the one I have personal experience with. A lot of academics, a lot of ed tech companies trying to figure it out. And I would, I would say anything like that would be a great place because you need to be with your peers who've tried it and failed, yay, uh, <laughs> or who uh, have tried it and succeeded and uh, what I liked about it was the strong uh, kind of scientific academic approach. All right, does this work and how did it go? And um, so that's the first. The second is, uh, and we haven't fully gotten this, but I, well, this isn't a resource, but it's just part of our thought process is thinking about equity in education and how how games can increase equity, but if you deliver it only in a certain way, it can decrease it. So if we only arrive, say, with a iPad game, for example, we are saying the the schools that don't afford i can't afford iPads don't get to play this. Game. You know, see what I'm saying? So, um, but in general, uh, we found that games in education increase equity as long as they can play that game. So. Um, other resources. Feel free to do shameless self-promotion if there's anything that we can do to help you guys out as well. Uh, we'd be oh, happy with that. Well, uh, I'm not. I'm not beneath it. So, you know, one one of the things that we just did. Here's my shameless self-promotion. Uh, is uh, I ran an event called Teacher Tech Jam, and it was hosted for free by a local museum. We did it as part of a meetup group uh, called EduCelerate, which is educational entrepreneurs, investors, uh, instructors. And we provided CEUs, continuing education units, to teachers. So in our state, they need 125 hour uh, uh, education hours every five years for relicensure. So I said, well, let's give them some food and some CEUs. Let's find a nice place to do this and give them uh, 20 minute sessions of various tech. And so they get to go from station to station. It was a huge success. All these teachers who had never been part of the group gave up their time on an evening. Why? Because there was something in it for them. The museum was tickled because all these teachers come. So it was just a way of bringing private, uh, you know, nonprofit and private business together and teachers in a way that we get to try it out, get feedback. And I think more of these partnerships are absolutely key. And, uh, and there are a lot of game companies now everywhere. And if you're near one, they, I would say to teachers, this is a way to, to start thinking about gamification and saying, hey, I'm interested in this. I'm interested in your games. Uh, show them to me, you know. So the more that we could have uh, connections with teachers that aren't dependent on a sales force, but are more dependent on a teacher wanting to change how, how they're practiced, that would be, I don't know, that would be huge for, for building games. And as I look around, what I hear more than anything is, we're tired of ed tech companies building products without talking to teachers. But it's hard to, it's hard to talk to teachers. So, uh, I think for ed tech companies, just finding new ways to connect with teachers is critical. So that's what we're trying to do more than anything. So. That's great. Great. Anything else you can think of? No, Adam, you've been great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Scott and Scott.